Welcome everybody to this event where we um, honor and, and celebrate um, the life of Jing Wang, who was a, a wonderful colleague and friend um, to everybody I think in this room and many of the folks online as well. Um, I'm Eric Klopper, I'm the head of Comparative Media Studies and Writing. I'm just going to sort of give a brief introduction to, to, to Jing's chronology um, at MIT, introduce the speakers that we're going to have today. Um, at the end of the, the session, there will be a chance for everybody um, both in the room and online to participate as well and, and contribute their thoughts um, on, uh, on the ways that Jing influenced their lives and their careers as well. Um, Jing was the SC Fang uh, Professor of Chinese Languages and Culture um, and a longtime member of the MIT faculty. Um, you know, she contributed in many ways to the lives of everybody in this room as a, as a teacher, uh, as a mentor, as a scholar, uh, as an inspiration. Um, Jing joined the faculty in 2001 as a professor in foreign languages and literature. Um, uh, she was uh, head of foreign languages and literature from 2005 to 2008. Um, she joined the CMSW or CMS at the time um, as a colleague, eventually as a joint appointment, um, and in 2019 as her primary appointment as well. Uh, in 2011, uh, Jing was appointed as the SC Fong professorship. Um, we're grateful that Douglas Fong, who is joining us uh, this evening as a representative of the Fong family, um, and they generously established the SC Fong Chair of Chinese Language and Culture uh, in 1992. We appreciate that uh, the family is joining us today um, to share their respects and appreciation of Jing's contributions. Uh, Jing was a, a, a tireless a mentor, a scholar, uh, 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 both fighting for folks on campus um, and around the world. Um, she was a pioneer in the field of Chinese studies um, and an uh, inspiration uh, for, for scholars uh, in, in this area all around the world. Um, uh, we were sad when, when Jing passed away this summer um, at the age of 71, this past July. Um, and today, at this colloquium, we publicly honor her life and work, and we'll feature four brief talks um, from some of the people who knew her best. And they include uh, Emma Tang, who's the Wei Fong Chao Professor of Asian Civilizations at MIT History and the Director of Global Languages. Uh, T.L. Taylor, who's a Professor of Comparative Media Studies at MIT and co-founder of Eniki. Uh, Han Su, who's the founder and CEO of Privoche. And finally, Tammy Barlow, who's the George and Nancy Ruff Professor of Humanities at Rice University and met uh, Jing in 1986 at Duke. Uh, with that, I will um, open it. Oh, I'm sorry. And then uh, again, we'll have a video uh, that will uh, be between TL and Han. And at the end, I'll have a chance for everybody to contribute their thoughts. So, with that, I will invite up and off. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. It's really my privilege to be able to be here to remember my dear colleague, Jim Wong. Brilliant, critical thinker, visionary, rigorous, committed, indispensable. Fierce intellect, fearless, kind, warm, caring, fighter, lovely person, politically engaged, activist, funny, complicated, a peach, <laughs> concerned for justice, anti-elitist, trusted ally, confidant, confidant devoted, devoted teacher, teacher mentor, mentor, advocate, advocate loving mother, mother, true friend, sui generis. These are just some of the list of words that I heard from people at MIT and far beyond in those very long days following her death in July. But for me, there's a single word that sums it up for Jing, irreplaceable. Jing was born in Taiwan in May 1950, very soon after the Chinese nationals retreat to Taiwan in December 1949. Her family was part of the mass exodus of mainland Chinese following the communist revolution. And I believe that this experience of exile and displacement shaped Jing's life in profound ways. Jing grew up an outsider. She belonged neither to the local Taiwanese community nor to the mainlander elites that dominated Taiwanese politics and society during that time. In an interview for CMS in 2013, Jing described her experience as the daughter of a sea captain and a housewife. She said it was very, very difficult being lower middle class back then. I believe that her anti-elitism and her concern for justice grew from these experiences. Jing also learned to become a fighter. 
As was common for Chinese girls during this era, she faced the preference for sons over daughters, the inherent gender bias in Confucian culture, and she dedicated her life to fighting this injustice. In fact, at the time of her death, she was serving on the Shaft's Gender Equity Committee, and committee chair, Professor Chris Capazzola, remembers her as one of the more active committee members. Okay, for those of you who served on a committee with Jing, you know exactly, <laughs> exactly what, what is a lot of more active. Now, as a child of refugees, as a girl in a male-dominated society, Jing turned her energy, passion, and brilliance to academic pursuits. She attended the top university in Taiwan, Taiwan National University, majoring in the prestigious foreign languages department. Her classmates recall to me how she shone in the classroom, asking the most perceptive questions, giving the most thoughtful, astute responses and critical readings. But her, her pursuits at this time were always constrained in Taiwan in the 1950s and 60s due to the fact that it was under martial law. There was no freedom of speech, no freedom of the press, no freedom of assembly, no freedom to organize. Even for a scholar of a subject, perhaps seemingly apolitical, such as comparative literature, there were constraints on the books you could read, on the theory you could study, on the words you could write. So Jing's keen interest in Marxist theory and criticism that developed later in her life really must be understood against this background of repression. Like essentially all elite students in Taiwan at that time, she came to the United States for graduate study during the 1970s. She earned her PhD in comparative literature from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And um, her dissertation advisor, Lucian Miller, still fondly remembers her as one of the most brilliant students he has ever taught. Now, leaving behind the constraints of Taiwan, Jing found herself uh, you know, horizons opening wide before her, and she explored very widely and voraciously, embarking on what would become her wide range of intellectual journey, constantly challenging herself to learn more, experience more, write more. Coming from martial law Taiwan, Jing found the freedoms of American academia and democracy precious. And to the end of her life, she was a staunch defender of free speech, academic freedom, and democracy. One thing that always stood out to me about Jing was that she was fiercely proud to be an American. She was also fiercely critical of the ways in which America failed to live up to its promise. And as Ken has asked me to remind everybody, Jing was a staunch advocate for racial justice for all groups. And in this last two years, she was deeply concerned about anti-Chinese sentiment, anti-Asian violence, and the targeting of scientists of Chinese descent, especially after our own Professor Gong Chen's arrest last year. Following her PhD, Jing spent three years at Middlebury College and then joined faculty at Duke, where she taught for 16 years before coming to MIT. And she then quickly became a highly valued leader <clears throat> in Chinese studies, as well as in CMS, as Eric has already mentioned. A recognized pioneer in the field of China studies, Jing earned accolades for her scholarship on the Chinese literature, culture, and media. Never content to rest on her laurels and perpetually driven by her intellectual curiosity, Jing changed her area of specialization and methodological approaches numerous times over the decades. And this, I think, is one of the key challenges in even trying to begin to think about replacing Jing. Right? She is truly irreplaceable. Beyond traditional academic pursuits, Jing gave her talents and energy to a highly innovative endeavor, the nonprofit NGO 2.0, which she launched with Chinese collaborators in 2009 to help Chinese grassroots organizers use social media to be change agents. And I believe there will be more um, information on that this evening. I want to end by noting what a dedicated teacher Jing was. She taught a broad spectrum of classes and she was even developing a new class on romance and Chinese fiction that she never had the opportunity to teach. 
Since her death, many of her former students have reached out to me to tell me of the deep impact she had on them. And I know what a transformative teacher she was because she was also my teacher. Jing left this world as a teacher. On the Sunday morning of her untimely death, Jing was teaching a class in China on Zoom. And I keep this image because to me, it's so quintessentially Jing, just irreplaceable. Thanks, Emma. That was so nice. It's funny because over the years I've heard, you know, you hear stories from your friend about their life and trajectory and you just put it together wonderfully. And uh, thank you so much for sharing all that. Um, my remarks are going to be a little more extemporaneous um, and a, a little less on her, her intellectual life and more my experience of Jing as a friend, which I, I know she was to so many here. Um, I was thinking about the first time I met Jing, and it's funny when you go somewhere for a job, you know, it's like three days or whatever, two days of whirlwind meetings, and, but I, yet I have a very clear memory of Jing that visit I came here of this very petite woman sitting at the back of the room. And when Q&A came after my lecture, she sort of leaned forward. I think she had, you know, pad in hand and asked this really terrific question. And for those who don't know me, I do stuff on gaming. I think at the time I was just finished an esports book. I mean, so in some ways orthogonal. And she was just there. And I just, I remember that. And so my first experiences of Jane here were as a colleague and serving with her on committees and the just the diligence and the care, sometimes the needed ferocity, just the commitment she had. I, I was looking back through emails uh, over the years I've had with her. And there was one where when I was going up for full professor, she had like line edited my personal statement with just like these really careful, thoughtful. And I just, it was, you know, it was it's such a generosity to give people and things that kind of attention and it just when i think of jing as a colleague it, it's such a defining feature of her i would say too as a colleague she was always so committed to keeping our larger vision conversations going whether it's with our grad program or who we were going to be as a department in the future so i think you know i first came to know her as a colleague um and in that way, one of the things I was also struck with always with Jing is the vibrancy, the vibrancy of her intellect, of her spirit, of her engagement with everything. Um, once I think she got a handle on kind of what I did, she was always sending me links, <laughs> links to esports articles, links to live streaming, links to gaming. Here's a connection in China. Just, you know, the generosity of also recognizing in the other what they're interested in and finding ways to connect with them through that um, is something I think of as so Jing. An email that says, check your WeChat, and then you go to WeChat because she's found something on, on WeChat that you need to take a look at. Um, so I, I, count, I count myself really lucky to have had her as a colleague. It's rare we get colleagues that we, you know, have that we value so much and have those connections with. Um, but over time, I, I really came to more so value my friendship with her. Um, and I, I think a couple of people have heard this story, but it, it, for me, it's, it sort of sums up so much of Jing in so many ways. I remember the first time she invited me to dinner at her house, which I'm sure some of you have done before. And at the time, I was living at a dorm here on campus in Simmons. I didn't have a car. And so she invited my partner and I, Mickey, and so we got a zip car. And you know, you reserve a zip car, okay, you know, seven to 10. <laughs> no, <laughs> we went to Jing's house for dinner. And of course, Jing is role. She's an amazing, she was an amazing cook, amazing cook. And in a, you know, former life, she had actually kind of had a restaurant, I think. And yeah, um, so she's just rolling out course after course. And we're realizing, oh my God, it's almost 10 and we are still in this. And I try to adjust the, the uh, reservation and I can't, we have to leave. And she's like, what? <laughs> we still have three courses to go, horrified. Lesson learned. Of course, she piled it all up in takeaway, you know, whatever she had, she gave us boxes to go. And I learned if you go for dinner with Jing, you are having a real dinner that's gonna last hours and be filled with amazing food and conversation. Um, and if it wasn't at her house, I, one of the other last times I got to eat with her, I, she took me to dim sum in, when we were, we happened to be in New York City at the same time, dim sum 
with Jing was, was amazing because all of that kind of knowing what she wanted, knowing how to make it best for everybody and, you know, getting us all the right food, just wonderful. That bonding over food was for me such a classic Jing thing. And I think a lot of folks over the years her, experienced her generosity. She would often open up her home to students who were here over the holidays and invite them over for meals when everybody else was going off and um, just that kindness extended. The other thing I just wanted to mention something um, I loved about her was the kind of, con you know, the calls and the commiserations and the talking. And those of you who know me know I love my leisure time. <laughs> I, I have a lot of hobbies and Jing and I respectively teased each other about this <laughs> because, you know, she had her zither, she had her hobbies, but she was focused on her hobbies. And I often joked with her that you know, I would, if I could, I would retire now, but she would still be working 20 years from now. <laughs> and, you know, she just constantly had new projects and was constantly engaged. Um, I talked to her the day before she died and we had, uh, she had, again, very generously brought me into one of her networks in China and we were on a project there and going to go over there together. And she was, you know, this excitement about this next new thing that she was doing. Um, I was always amazed by her energy. <laughs> Could often not keep up even when we were walking, but she was a, a dynamic, vibrant, deeply loving person. Um, uh, and while it's a loss to of our colleague, uh, she's, I think those of us who knew her as something also other than a colleague, it's a tremendous loss that care. So that's it. It's very pity to meet you guys here. Um, for me, uh, Professor Wang is, uh, I know her as a founder of NGO 2.0 and also my mentor. Um, she passed away all of a sudden. And I was actually uh, in the meeting in the morning, she was uh, having with the NGO 2.0 uh, colleagues and all of a sudden, we saw the message. Um, she passed away on Facebook, but I was uh, very shocked. I thought it's fake, but sadly, it's true. Um, yeah, she's not just my mentor in terms of academia, but also uh, for life, for um, career, and a lot of things. So I remember the first time, like during the orientation, she uh, everyone was asked to show a picture of themselves. Um, she showed her avatar, which is also the avatar I first saw when I sent the first email to her. It's, a, it's like a super woman in a game. Uh, it's a super woman with a sword on her back. Um, I was, when, I was, um, when I was sending the email, I was wondering, does she play a lot of video games? <laughs> um, she, she liked that avatar. I think um, she has a sense of uh, being a super woman uh, as a, someone in this world. And she has that sense of justice, in my opinion. Um, you know, she is a, um, she, she believes in Buddhism, if you guys don't know. So in Buddhism, it's like you don't need to do a lot of things, you just uh, let it be. So it's sort of antithetical to his uh, to her way of devotion to her life. And uh, I was very curious on why she worked so hard in the very beginning. But as I, uh, as I got to know her better, I realized this, I think it's her sense of justice. She has a critical lens towards a lot of things. And when, when she believes there is injustice, she tried to change it. So um, yes. Um, other people uh, uh, <laughs> understand she, she loves uh, cooking and she loves um, eating um, in different restaurants. Uh, the first piece of information she shared with me was Haymarket uh, in Boston and some <laughs> hidden gems, uh, Chinese restaurants in Chinatown. She also invited me and other friends to different restaurants uh, from time to time. Um, she, 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 she has a very good taste in a lot of things, especially food. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, once I was eating at a restaurant, she recommended me 
uh, not with her, but I bumped into her. So I was not, uh, it's not, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's not unexpected at all. So I know she, she would be at those different restaurants. Mm. And she also cooked uh, very well, very professionally. And she invited me and Iago to her house uh, during Thanksgiving since we were the only two international students there and we don't have a place to go. So um, it was a very good experience. Mm. She, I remember there was a dish called, um, it's a Chinese dish, but I've never seen that dish. She said it's vegan fish. So I was wondering, what, what, what the hell, what, how could the fish be vegan? <laughs> and so, so she explained, she learned that dish from a Sichuanese chef migrated from mainland China to Taiwan. And that dish is lost in mainland China. And that's why I haven't ever tried that dish in, before uh, in my life. Um, she was pretty proud of that. She, maybe she was the only person who could, could have made that dish. Um, and later on, uh, in summer 2019, um, we, we met in Beijing, back in China. Um, uh, I remember I was inviting her to um, eat something with me in China. I was saying, uh, in, in the US, you treat me, so now you're in China, maybe I should treat you. And she was like, no, no, um, you're still a student. Maybe when you uh, become rich or when you work, you treat me, but it's very, very unfortunate. Unfortunately, I don't have a chance anymore. Mm. Uh, she is, um, she has a very strong sense of justice. Um, as I mentioned, she, I, I think she started NGO 2.0, uh, not all of a sudden, but uh, before that she was doing work. She was a head of Creative Commons uh, of China or of Asia, I forgot. But she found um, Creative Commons is, uh, to be frank, is not useful to most of the Chinese citizens. Mm, it's a uh, design still in the uh, Ivy uh, Tower. Uh, so it's not helping a lot of uh, Chinese people. Uh, so when information is, even in today, there are still half of the Chinese people living in a standard of uh, less than 200 USD per month. So almost half a billion, more than half a billion people still living with, a, with less than 200 USD per month in China. So she understands that something like Creative Commons won't directly help those Chinese people. Um, and I think she doesn't want to get involved into political power or money too much, she still wants to really empower those people who really need her help. So she decided to uh, um, do something that will empower the local governmentalities organizations. That's the social organizations back in China. And her method is to use, um, to provide technical solutions to those local NGOs as an NGO themselves, NGO 2.0. So it's called NGO 2.0 because Web 2.0 is to let everybody to participate to the web. So NGO 2.0 is to use technical solutions to empower every social organizations in China to uh, communicate to do marketing. Mm, so she has, she's very proud of her practic practical um, experience. Uh, apart from her uh, ac ac uh, success in academia. So I think she understands how to really change the so-called change the world. It's not just writing. She, 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 I think she has two ways to change the world. One is to um, directly uh, help use her power to empower others. The other is to communicate to different people. Uh, of her, uh, through her, her writings, her books. So she, she, when I was writing the thesis, she said, um, if you write something, you have to uh, make it valuable by letting different people uh, read your 
work. So if you re if you write something that no one will uh, really read, then it's not valuable at all. So she, I think she understands um, how to make changes through practice. Um, and for me, uh, she, she she actually has nothing with uh, to do with mainland China. She was born in Taiwan and then become a Chinese American. But she still choose to um, dedicate her uh, past 10 years uh, in the field work of mainland China. And she is, of course, she, of course, she is not a nationalist. And she defined herself as a leftist. And I think she understands um, what's a true privilege. Uh, for example, nationality is one of them. And technical um, uh, literacy is one of them. So she tries to help those people who are uh, not heard, not seen um, through her um, uh, through her uh, different practical means. Um, I remember when I first visited her house, uh, I saw two uh, very heavy dumbbells, 25 pounds. Uh, I, was, I was wondering who is using those kind of heavy uh, dumbbells. And she said, if you, if, you, if you didn't know, I was a sports woman. I did weightlifting, so I was pretty surprised. Um, yeah, but sadly she uh, had a stroke when she worked out at the gym. Um, but still, I think she uh, tries to intentionally join those weights on her shoulder to fight for the greater good, not just physically, but also at the last 20 years, she tried to crack, uh, to, to, to devote herself in the real world, do as, do as much as possible. So even at the last day of her life, she was still working at the NGO to find the projects. And even right now, I still feel like <laughs> she may shoot me a message on WeChat and ask me to join some meeting to, promote, to provide my opinions. Mm -hmm. I think even though she has passed away, um, uh, there are still a lot of things that she has left to me. Um, for example, at least she uh, encouraged me to uh, work on my own career or on my own, on my own project to bring my own um, thoughts into a a uh, real organization that can work well in that can work in this uh, world. So I, after working several months, I decided to my own uh, company. And she, uh, I think I will carry out her ideals and keep fighting for the greater good. And that's my yeah, all, all I want to say. Yeah. We have, all right, if you guys give me just a moment, I'm going to set up the video that Han provided. Um, it also has some footage of Jing recently that was uh, provided by MGF 2.0. Being Jin's older cousin, my mother told me about Aunt Jin's extraordinary accomplishment when I was young. Growing up, I was so proud of Aunt Jin's perseverance, hard work, and intellect. The first time we met Aunt Jin in person was 2008, the year our family moved to Boston. Since then, we have held many family gatherings whenever Aunt Jin's busy schedule allowed. Aunt Jin loved to share with us her many life experiences, from language learning, grocery shopping, Chinese medicine and acupuncture, to her favorite gardening and cooking recipes. She cared about the grandchildren very much and often recommended the classical literature to them. I benefited from those readings too. When she learned that my youngest daughter Jessica loved cooking, Aunt Jin ordered one of her favorite magazines for her, Bon Appetit. I still vividly remember Aunt Jin saying, not only are the recipes good, but the articles are written in excellent English. Since the pandemic 
started last year. Aunt Jin spent more time at home, and we saw each other more often. She had planned to slow down a bit and spend more time with friends and family relatives. We had more opportunity to enjoy food and share experience together. In early July, at Aunt Jin's home, she treated us with her homemade paella. We never have thought that was the last gathering. Even now, it is hard to believe our energetic and lovely Aunt Jin is no longer with us. Aunt Jin and I shared the passion of gardening. A few years ago, Aunt Jin gave us one of her favorite plants, the night blooming cactus, Tanhua in Chinese. Summer is Tanhua's blooming season. Born like a summer flower, born like the pure heavenly Tanhua. I pray Aunt Jin is eternally happy in heaven and rest in peace. Jing was always busy. Even on vacation, there were things to do, questions to ask, things to learn, things to teach. Jing lived her life with purpose, with determination, and with concern for others. For all of her activity, she was never frantic. There was a focus in everything she did. We enjoyed meeting in New York City to go to museums and walk in the parks. Her critical eye was always busy, examining everything she saw. Her tastes were modern, current, but she valued tradition in art, literature, and music. She looked deeply at everything and informed herself of what was going on in the world through multiple lenses. She focused on what she felt was not sufficiently understood, not critically examined, not appreciated on its own terms. I think she viewed life as an opportunity to explore and to make contributions. Even during the darkest days of her life, she wanted to help others, to help with their grief, their loss, their frustrations. Jing was never helpless, never felt sorry for herself, never stopped. Every moment spent with others was an opportunity to share. I will miss her voice, her laughter, and her friendship. She was inspiring. We're happy to start this video as a tribute to Jing for her life and legacy. I'm Miriam, and this is Bruce. We want to thank Jing for all of the blessings that she has bestowed on us. So behind me, you see the um, red feng shui wall hanging that she gave me. She wanted to make sure that I was protected. Um, and behind us, we now have the tree. Go ahead. This tree was given to us by Jing at Candy's passing <clears throat> back in January of 2001. And the tree, like Jing, and everything that is connected to her has grown better and be more beautiful and more memorable for us as we enjoy her presence through nature, even when we cannot always enjoy her presence in person. And so as we think of her today and we give thanks for everything that she gave us, we also want to give her back this small but very sincere tribute for everything that she's done. May she and Candy find each other and move beyond the bardo into enlightenment uh, with all our love. With all our love and with every hope that this, this recording and everything else that's done on Jing's behalf will reach her and continue to be beneficial for us in years and years to come. Thank you, Jing. Thank you, Candy. Goodbye. From 2007, we started the Gong Yi 2.0 
，而您带着团队，凭着无比的勇气和锐意的创新，将中国的技术工艺推向了前所未有的高度。马老师，感恩十年相遇，感谢您的提携，您一路走好，我会继续您的事业。公益组织一旦学会了如何使用互联网和新媒体，不但可以突破传播方面的瓶颈，同时也能够培养社会创新的思维。N 九二点零十岁生日了，我们一路走过来，坚持草根的精神，不变初心。在下一个十年里，我希望啊、呃，有更多的人能理解技术工艺，与我们同行。王老师，十二年来，您一直是我们 N 九二点零的大家长，率领我们前行，教导我们知行合一。您放心，孩子们会撑起这个家的。中国的工艺应该是什么样的？任何国家都一样，最好的前景，工艺的前景是人人可工艺。中国也在往这个方向走。She is a female Avenger. And Jane created this avatar when she was experimenting with Second Life, and we all know that whenever Jane was starting something new, she would call your own phone and say, "Guess what?" <laughs> <laughs> and this time it was, "You should join me in Second Life." <laughs> <laughs> Not really to me. I'm very much upset that I didn't do it, so I could have played with her. <laughs> But from that, she came up with this beautiful figure of the female avatar. And she used that ever after. I was asked to speak a little bit about her intellectual achievements.、Um, I met Jane、uh, in my first academic、um, uh, conference. I was so green to the profession that I didn't realize she had to be invited to these things. <laughs> I got an ad, a、uh, you know, propaganda ad, and I thought, oh, I have some power money. I think I'll go to Durham. This looks really interesting. It's about Sharon Paul. So that's how I met Jean,、um, who was then、uh, I think that Cammy was just a little child. In any case, we really bonded in the way that many of you bonded with Jean, and we began our our work together.、Um, In 1992, she won the Joseph Levinson Prize for the best、um, work in traditional Chinese studies, and I need to underscore how difficult that was. Not just because Jane was brilliant and、uh, the book is magnificent, but the idea of a young, beautiful Chinese woman winning an academic prize was so startling that I can remember sitting. While she received the prize, and thinking this has never happened at the AAS before, and she made it very clear that she was from Taiwan, so it was extremely important. But there was something about that book which made it astounding that she would win a prize because what she did basically was a critic's devastating critique. She managed to take something. Absolutely banal, traditional novels, and turn it into something really deeply exciting by seeing things there that other people had not seen. So, as others have mentioned, Jane never tread the same path twice. So, immediately,、uh, four years later, she came out with High Culture Fever. Now, Hermita was a really formative book because it was at that time. 
um, the subtitle is Politics, Aesthetics, and Ideology in Guns China. Not only did were we as a generation, Jing was born five months after me, and we were both double white tigers astrologically, so we had a great deal in common in that way, too. Um, we were beginning to meet the people who were responsible for the cultural fever that led up to the political events of 1989. Uh, and so through her and with her and in these expanding networks that are the great pleasure of being involved in Chinese intellectual life, uh, I met Wei Tianjun, Dai Jinhua, Li Zhehou, and many of the other major actors from whom she wrote. This book had a tremendous impact on my generation because we were the same age and we had lived through cultural revolution times. So the exhilaration of the 1980s was reminiscent of the May 4th movement, the other great uh, enlightenment movement in China. And we got to participate in that. Um, now she moved again uh, 14 years later after the, the politics of uh, Chinese politics, to which we all have a rather difficult relationship. Um, she began a new project, uh, or she published her 2010 book, Brand in China, which looked at advertising, media, and commercial culture. I believe that this was her way of entering the methodological challenge of studying and illuminating popular culture. She was devoted, as, as, as Emma pointed out. It wasn't just that she was an avenger. She also was devoted to showing that popular culture had as much depth as elite culture and that she was conversant in both traditions, that she could enjoy and explore and explain both the high and the, and the low. I just have to put it that way. Um, she began to hone her skills as a methodologist of popular sociology. I would say that in this respect, she was less a historian and more a sociologist and cultural theorist. And she began to develop her own singular skills as a critic. In 2019, the long way for the other digital China, non-confrontational activism on the social web uh, was released. She had been talking about this uh, project for many years. And, uh, you know, when we saw each other in China over food in Beijing or wherever we were, it was always about food. She was <laughs> full of ideas and thoughts about and the unfolding of this miraculous project that we just saw um, in the team. Um, I think that the uh, the way in which she positioned herself is extremely important. And that is as the critic of none, but the critic of all. She was, uh, other stuff testified, ferociously critical, but in a disarming way. I think that her politics of scholarship and in personal life and in the public sphere were all about displacement. It was never about critique. She really didn't have much time for people who grandstanded about critique or forwarded their favorite pet theory, uh, post-socialism, post-modernism in China and so on and so on. She was rather devastated privately about this kind of pretension. But she was herself wrenchingly critical and her merit pursuing activity intellectually was to pay back, I think, to show that you can be critical so long as you displace the current conjunction, as long as you point out where the problem is and provide solutions. And to me, that's what NGO 2.0 uh, is all about. It says, yeah, Chinese government is pretty scary, but like Chinese friends will say to you, Chinese government has always been really scary, so what's new? The question was not so much to, to, to exhaust the ways in which the Chinese government was, was a bad actor, 
so much as reaching people, technicians, business people, vocal activists, local people, marketers, branders, business women with investment possibilities to put all of these people into a rather peculiar mixture out of which a social movement was born. These are her achievements as a militant scholar. I want to talk a little bit about the flavor of Jane's intellect. Uh, that is, after all, how we met and why we stayed so close to each other is intellectual uh, joy. I think that uh, she always worked um, at the margin where she had a vision of the whole. And there are various personal reasons for that. But she could always find the opening where something new would come about. So she was always about, how does new come into the world? Um, that said, she, she was constantly looking and constantly opening up the possibility. I understand her, her recent um, interest was in history of youth. She was always interested in what young people have to say about their world and how they perceive the, the future possibilities because she was always thinking in the future anterior. When this will have happened in my lifetime, I will have achieved some of it, is the way I understand her intellectually. She was, after all, also a long distance runner. And I was joking with Emma about how Jane prepared to write a book. She started lifting those weights. She started going back to the gym. She started eating healthy and trying to sleep. But we all know she wasn't in um, But she trained for writing as though she were an athlete. And she would lecture me a copy to Lacey and not <laughs> <laughs> getting to the gym enough, and so on. And I took it uh, very seriously and tried to be a better scholar. Mm -hmm. There's something interesting about um, uh, when she took her first trip to uh, the People's Republic of China, uh, she was writing me and saying, I can't get anything to eat. And I thought, oh, uh, that's simply not possible. <laughs> um, and what it, what had happened is that she felt a sense of physical nausea. She couldn't find the things she could eat that would settle her stomach. Um, for uh, Chinese immigrants of my generation who came to the United States, that was a common problem. Uh, transitioning into American food was uh, finding uh, foods that were medically appropriate for the transition. And um, I never forgot this experience that she shared with me about nausea, because it seems to me that this was in some degree a part of who she was. The world nauseated she. It was so unkind and so unjust and so unfair. And there's a limit to what an avatar can do. I think that she was Buddhistic to begin with. And as she got older, she became more profoundly religious for this reason. At a certain point, you do absolutely the best you can. And there is nothing that you can do to fix it. People also underestimate the violence of her thinking. I think that Jane was uh, intellectually violent. She could cut to the core of things because she didn't care what got hurt in the process. This is ideas, not people. She would never personalize any of this. If your idea was crap, she would see it. But we would work together to displace that problem. That's a kind of violence that I very much enjoy, and that is why she has a sword on her. I'm, I'm going to be very brief with these comments, but I'm going to say to you that I believe that she has been massively underappreciated as a pioneering intellectual. We know her as a very uh, interesting, compassionate, religious woman 
who loved fashion and these fingernails are in her bonnet. Mm -hmm. um, a testament to our first public appearance together, where we all read, had read fingernails. Um, but there, it's not an accident that she won a prize for doing something that at that point only white men had been rewarded for. I don't know why this book isn't taught regularly, and why there's no historiography of this book, and why there are no students devoted to the thought of Jean Wong, who, of course, all of you know that her name was actually not Jane. Right? Jane Wong is the name that she was given uh, by English speakers. Her actual name is Wong Jean. There's no G. There's no model stop it. So she loved being American. She loved having that name. And she loved being Jane Wong. But it's my belief that we can do more to promote um, her intellectual heritage and give her the position and the priorities that she earned. Can I just follow that and say that the story of Stone is so good to talk as a last way in Berkeley? And so it's still carrying on. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. All those personal tales for many years um, and uh, and the, the call to the future influences of her work. Um, at this point, I'd like to welcome anybody in the room here or online who'd like to share. Any thoughts? Um, raise your hand either virtually or, or in person. I'll say one quick thing. Um, do we need a microphone or can I just shout? Yeah, you can shout. Sorry? That's a good shout. shout that. <laughs> it's staring at me with these terrible eyes. <laughs> um, I'm Tom Levinson, and um, uh, the, the, the mention of her prize uh, reminds me of when I first met Jing. I'd shown up here uh, in the 2004-05. Uh, and I, I got an office and I knew absolutely no one. And I had no real experience of professional academic life because being a professor's kid is not the same thing as being a professor. And one day this woman from a different, then a different department, uh, knocked on my door and, uh, and, and introduced herself as Jing Wong, not Wong Jin. And, um, and said, hi, welcome to MIT. And um, I'm so glad you're here because I got the Joseph Levinson Prize. And, um, and it was not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm telling you about it because it was not an expression of pride in her accomplishment. Uh, she was welcoming me. And, and, and I think uh, one of the things that, that, that um, uh, I think people have already commented on but uh, uh, Jean was a real um, colleague. She built departments, she made connections. And uh, I think she knew that uh, I was really adrift here. And uh, that I was adrift in part because I was uh, uh, not really comfortable and not really connected to the underlying culture of academic life. And she, you know, talked with me for some time on that first occasion, and we would uh, we would talk regularly. We we shared offices on the same hall for for many years, uh, and it was that sort of unequivocal welcome and that unequivocal sense of you know you belong here. You're you know there's a maybe a generational connection, but it's just you know this is good. Get down to work, and uh, and it's nice that we had this kind of just bizarre little non-connection connection that made it possible, which is what she used to express her welcome. So I was grateful for that at the time. I'm still grateful. And like I think everyone here, I am still uh, disbelieving uh, that, that 
those conversations won't happen again. That's all. Um, I'll, I'll add maybe anything. Um, you know, Jing, Jing did so much around when the Institute of the Department has had now, and it's possible for making sure I could find people to fill those roles. She just filled so many roles. <laughs> <laughs> so many people to fill those shoes. It's really, it's really amazing the, the work that she did, you know, at, at so many different levels throughout here, and so many people that she did that, that, that I, I just wasn't even aware of. So, really wonderful work that she did. Anybody else want to? I don't shouldn't share this. We just stand in front of it. Hi everyone, my name is Marina Tossi. I'm a junior undergrad here at course 15 CMS. Um, I had the pleasure along with my friend Willers here to take um, advertising and media comparative perspectives with Professor Wong, um, spring 2020. Um, as an MIT student, oftentimes I'm human and sometimes don't do all of my reading for my house classes, <laughs> but never once did I miss reading for Professor Wong's class. I knew she would always like cold call on us and <laughs> I could not be embarrassed in front of her. I could never let her down because I knew she would grill me instantly and move on to the next person. But I also did those readings because they were signed with like really like good care because she knew like we didn't want to waste our time. And everything she did was like impactful, meaningful. And those readings were really interesting, especially from her book, Brand New China. And yeah, I mean, it, it's so cheesy to say that her class was one of my favorites, um, and I don't say that just to say it, it truly was. Uh, Willers and I worked on this group project for the entirety of the semester, and I remember going up, we wanted to present just like the category for which, um, I'll actually just give a little background on the project, we have to choose a brand to reposition, um, but initially we had to choose a category. And one time, like category is very broad, and I, we were all very confused. And one time, I asked my friend, "Choose a category," and they said blue. <laughs> so we were <laughs> a little bit at a loss, but eventually, we decided on healthy snacks. Uh, we thought this presentation was supposed to be somewhat informal. We had a few slides that we put together maybe two hours before, and she tore it apart. <laughs> like no sense of oh you know like we'll change this it's like no like you're stop and <laughs> pick something else um, and, and she she did that on my slide and i just remember <laughs> tearing up like in front of the entire class completely embarrassed um but instead uh our group chose streetwear and that was like really cool that was really hip and we had like a great project we really bonded as a team um we have like our little WeChat group and it's still continuing and yeah Professor Wong was just like incredibly great as you all know and just like as a student in my like quasi freshman sophomore year even when things went virtual she made things incredibly engaging um and truly one of the best professors I've had here at Thanks so much for sharing that. Lots of, lots of students have been impacted over the years. Um, we also like to share. Yeah, um, just to say, Jim's phone number is still on my phone. We were conspirators. Uh, those late night calls, uh, future of big CMS. She was a really trusted confidant, and uh, I appreciate that a lot. She was also my introduction to China. I think every trip I've made to China, there have been a few, but thanks to Jane. And I think on all but one of them, I was able to meet her there, which was fantastic. It meant great restaurants. <laughs> and we, we shared a passion for cultural studies and the uh, English sense of it. And uh, it meant walking tours to the city that, that just it, it opened up. It opened up in ways that, that allowed me to sort of position myself between two cultures. I can't imagine that happening with anyone else. 
So lots to say about her, but I mean, I, I have to say, there's no way I could think of China um, without her just infusing all of it. Ironically, I've been to Taiwan without Cheng, and that was a, I actually sorely missed her there. I really needed that hermeneutic key to, to open that culture up. But. Thanks, William. Yes, I, I too was able to fortunately travel to China once with Jing and, um, and eat at all the great restaurants that she went to and had many fond memories of that. Yep, Paul. Awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to build on this idea of intellectual violence. I really appreciate that phrase to really capture something special that it's both sort of super sharp, but also somehow kind, there's kindness in the violence. I was thinking of also calls late at night. I think I, we, I won't say who, but we wrote something collectively and she called up at 10 p.m. and said, this is embarrassing, who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> and as, as we had a kind of gradually kind of talk it through, you know, she had really specific, very sharp ways of revising, ways of sort of getting past uh, what sort of a posturing response would be, but actually to get what we really were trying to say there. Um, and I found that really inspiring. Also, coming from a completely non-academic family and sort of navigating my way through, just to hear her say, you know, dismiss entire entire lines of thought, you know, that she thought were obsolete at this point. I would just kind of look around, can you say stuff like that? <laughs> but to, to be able to, to have that kind of confidence at the same time, it's kind of come across this in a way that's not going to make people defensive or not going to make people kind of shut down. Um, I think that that's something I really was inspired by and took away from. I think the, the last time we met, we had plans to go hiking because there was a hill nearby where she lived that she'd gotten lost on trying to go up and come back down again. She'd gone, back, gone down the wrong way and ended up in a different part of town. Um, and that, that kind of challenge was something she wasn't just going to dismiss. She was going to come back. So we were going to try and go up that hill again, find the right way down, and find the right path. Um, so just that kind of clarity on what mattered and what, what didn't matter, uh, I think was really, uh, will continue to be inspired. Great metaphor for her life. Thanks. Anybody else? You're going to put Professor's pause. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not hearing anybody else. Um, we do, we have a, a reception after this, which is just, I think, outside that way, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and the, the you know, tent out there um, where we can share each other stories with each other um, more informally. We some food and drink there as well. Um, so please uh, head over that way. I think people don't need to scan in again. Is that right? Or they do need to scan in. Only if they're new. Only if they're new. So if they happen to be showing us. Okay. So we should say that. Okay. But thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing, everybody. Um, thank, and thank you to Jane for all the people whose lives she touched um, here and elsewhere. So thank you. <laughs>